Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week with an album review as we usually do on these Saturdays where we check out an entire album track by track exploring each song in isolation and its place within the larger work. Today we're looking at a group called Tatrin which is vaguely familiar to me which usually means that we've checked it out on live stream. But uh, it could also be that we've checked out one of their tracks for a full reaction, but it just might have been years ago. Regardless, I don't have any expectations in store for this. We have 43 minutes of music at only 9 songs for that. Probably looking at about a 3 hour, 3 hour 15 minute video here. Let's dive into the first track here, The No, and see what Tatrin is bringing to the table today. Cool little atmosphere, strong groove. Oh. A very, s yeah, A very slow three four. What's interesting is the tapping in the background. Yeah, we're getting 12 of those in the span, creating a little bit of a polyrhythmic idea there. Yeah, so it allows us to break up each of our three beats one two three four 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 it breaks up each of those into four so you can feel the song in groups of three or groups of four so far I like the melody in that last section too little bit of syncopation with this idea over here. Sort of a jazzy guitar walk down on the right. I love that. Sort of these uh, diminished seaside vibes. <laughs> yeah, there's that walk down again so clean bringing us out of that darkness finding something a bit brighter still tense not perfect but beautiful sort of chimes, pitched metal sticks. Something that sounds like violins, sliding pitches though. And harmonic dissonance. Oh, also the gradual slowing down of the drum kit, the pitch detunement, the whole song sounded like it was uh, a toy box running out of energy. 
Oh, and it was instrumental too. It just it just dawned on me there's no uh, vocals in that. Cool. Um, yeah, there's some awesome stuff in here. It is a a singular song of growth. Every time we revisited a section, we added a new layer to it. We started off with just the synth and the drums. Um, and then we eventually added that lead guitar line. And then we added a syncopated line over here, right? And then the jazzy guitar stuff over here. And then our final section had a lot of heavy, uh, prominent synth pad chordal stuff going on and that was like the last 15 seconds before the sonic degradation pulling us towards the end moment of the track so yeah it's very much an a section where every time we repeat it we add more layers on like a slow burn but not necessarily well yeah i mean it does it does go somewhere doesn't it it does build up to that final section it's not a huge peak but it is the peak of the song so, I want to talk about some of the things going on with it, because that's like just a general overview. This is what the song does <laughs> uh, structurally, but there's a lot of other cool things going on, so I want to touch on them. First of all, emotional resonance. I love how the song continues to evolve as we progress through it. It's like when you listen to just the rhythm, oh, there's also that... that uh, the four taps per beat that we had. I forgot to mention that in the build-up element. I mean, just the idea is that we keep adding new things to it. Um, but yeah, when the song starts, it's just sort of chill. There's a little bit of darkness present, but for the most part, it's just a moody atmosphere with a groove to it. We get a beautiful melody on top of that, and that creates this element of positivity to me. It's still a, a darker background but what's in the foreground it, to me feels more positive trying to find um, how these two differing elements can clash but also create a beauty through that that uh, a separation of, of running these two things juxtaposed to each other um, against each other and seeing what comes out the other side and so having that darker moodier background with the beautiful more uplifting melody is really great it allows both of them to shine stronger than if they were alone but then we bring in the extra synth pad stuff. And we bring in the uh, strings and synth stuff that's off to the left here. And that, that weighs it more towards the dark side. Gives it more of that moodier vibe. It allows that to stand out as more than. But the next time through we get the jazzy guitar stuff off on the right. And that lifts everything up just a little bit more. It rebalances things out. The section after this though brings that really large prominent synth pad. And this is of course close to the peak of the song here. And once again we're dipping back towards favoring the darkness. But not too long after this, this explodes into a very bright, positive ending, balancing things out. And I'd even say pulling the bright side up a little bit more where it hadn't really been as prominent throughout the track. It's always been level or beneath the darker background sounds. And all of this, this, this weighting of the, the brightness having dominance tips back and then falls out of favor as we go into that super dissonant ending. I'm not sure what it's all supposed to represent, and without lyrics, it is very much up to interpretation of the listener. Um, mm, you know what? I think I'm going to give it a couple more songs, like usual, but I am going to go look at something like Wikipedia and Genius and see if I can find any... Um, official annotations or even interviews with this group and see if there is any definitive idea about what's supposed to be going on with these songs. I do want to give myself still some time to acclimate to the album and try to get my own perspective on it. But I am kind of curious where some of these song ideas came from, what they mean to the band, especially since we don't have lyrics to get a little bit of that insight into an authorial intent. 
But, I mean, what I see in this track is this constant battle between bright and darkness and how it's really a yin and yang thing. You can't really favor one without the other. You need both of them because they create that strong contrast, which allows both of them to be more prominent. The darker sections are moodier because they come after these bright, beautiful segments. Um, and that explosive positivity that comes through the end, that hope in those final 20 seconds is as impactful as it is because of that heavy dissonant synth that came right before it. It allows to punch through that darkness and showcase itself even better because of where we've been. Contrast is such a powerful tool for writing something like this, and I appreciate that they can balance all of it and kind of explore both of these sides and how they work in the middle where they meet it really is beautiful stuff and like i said that you can take that concept and make all sorts of interpretations out of it now there's some really interesting choices in here with the production starting off it's very clean little bit of fuzz a little bit of of and I just just grit to it. But for the most part, every instrument is specifically placed in the mix with plenty of space between it and the other instruments. There's just room for everything. Nothing's really overshadowing anything else. And even as we continue to add layers, you can hear all the stuff below those new layers perfectly fine. There is a clarity to the mix. Um, and like I said, mostly cleanliness too. It isn't sterile. There is a little bit of um, some stuff to grid it up, probably some, some tape noises, uh, maybe a little bit of compression on different instruments, just in order to make it not feel completely computer made. And actually, I'm not even sure about that. See, the picture here for the artist, oh, it's an instrumental trio. I, I told myself I'd wait a little bit, but Spotify had me interested here because the artist picture doesn't have people in it. It's a crowd. <laughs> uh, but it's an instrumental trio. I'm not going to read any more than that right now, but it does seem like there are three people playing instruments. So it's not just one. There might be some digital elements to it. Of course, there are synth pads in here, but we do have the guitar, and I think the drums are... Um, actually played as well as an acoustic kit. Um, so enough to just give it this feeling of real instruments, even if they aren't all real instruments, uh, rather than being completely digitally made. The production does a fantastic job at that. But as we get more towards the end of the track and things get more and more cluttered, we find that the production actually gets grittier. That final synth pad that sits above everything blocks out some of the sound. It makes it more difficult to pinpoint them. It doesn't push anything into the mix like, say, a, a lo-fi black metal track would. It never quite hits those extremes. It is still rather clean and clear uh, comparatively. But I do like how they weren't afraid to get messy with the production to make the song sound like it was being blotted out by this darkness cast over the sky and bringing this, uh, this era of, sh of shadow into, into play. Not every, not every artist would, would be down to do that, especially one that starts out so clean as it does here. Uh, usually that clarity is of the utmost importance for producers who are used to creating what I kind of feel at the beginning is more of a poppier production sound. But bringing in some of that distortion, that, that uh, compression, the overshadowing there at the end, I thought that was a really nice technique. And to me it showcases... Mm, it, showcases it showcases an acclimation towards what the song needs from a production angle. It's not so much of this is how I like to make music, this is how I like it to sound, so we're going to keep it this way. It's what does the song need right now. And to me, that's a bit of more of a progressive stance than I would have expected with this. And I think that's primarily because I don't know where to place this. 
musically, I think if this was a rock group, which it, it might still be labeled rock, given the uh, guitar and drums, but electronic tends to have very clean, precise production. And that's sort of where I place this at the moment anyways, is that this is an electronic track. And outside of a few grittier subgenres, a lot of the main genres of electronic, though, would not get into stuff that would overshadow or, or destroy the sound in any way that creates a hurdle, I think, for the listener. And while I don't think we quite reached the point with the production here with that, it is something that I just wasn't expecting given the sound for them to go as far as they did. Um, but the song is progressive then, isn't it? In a way, in a sense, it is a slow burn and it is a combination of electronic sounds and rock ones. I'm kind of curious then if this is an intro. Well, dang, I just... I was going to say, I wonder if this is an intro and that the rest of the album, the next eight songs are going to be different. Maybe they'll be more traditionally rock. Uh, maybe we'll have vocals. But I did spoil myself a bit and the description on Spotify says they're an instrumental trio. So I'm going to assume that the other eight tracks are also instrumental, which might cut down my expectation for the length of this video. You all know how long this is already. You can just look down there. But I, I kind of pride myself on my ability to kind of guess how long an album review is going to take. And uh, yeah, uh, lyrical analysis certainly takes some time. But we don't have lyrical analysis today. So, to wrap up my thoughts on this track, because I kind of got scattered a little bit there. I like the production. I like the sounds they're creating. I like the balance and the narrative that they told with this introduction. And I'm intrigued about where we're going forward because this does feel like a midpoint between electronic and progressive rocks. I'm also curious what their structure is going to be as we go forward throughout this album, are they going to stick with this general idea of create an A section and expand it over time? They made four minutes not feel like four minutes. It felt like a very natural progression to go through this despite the heavy repetition of the bottom layers that we've heard at the clo closer to the beginning of the track. They, I think they can keep that up with some of these tracks. There's a lot of three and four minute songs in here which probably will follow this but we also have some stuff closer to six and a half seven minutes we have one that's almost six minutes could they expand this out for those tracks or are they going to explore a different structure how many of the songs are going to be these slow burns or do, do they have any more linear concepts i don't know we'll get there and we'll get there by moving one song at a time which is a Decent segue, I suppose, to get into our next track, Evermore. So, let's push forward and see where Tatrin is taking us next. So we have another song in three, another moody atmosphere. Another simple foundation with plenty of room for expansion. some of that harmonic tension again always sparsely oh beautiful little line there we go again with another little jazzy line
forgot about just how little or how many little jazzy beats two beats little runs came in the no Ooh, whoa whoa what was that love the bass filling in the space also this is like a super catchy guitar melody it's the second time we've heard it this song and I'm humming it along in my head with it little flourish on it that's nice smallest hint of microtonality going on in the foundation here. I really thought that was going to bring in some groove, but it's not. It's just this, just this punctuating element. something theremin like off on the side tons of reverb sci-fi etherealness there's the melody again are you humming along to you this time Interesting to bring the rhythmic energy up right here at the end. A real lengthy fade out. Yeah, I mean, so far, I'm kind of enjoying this album more than I would expect. I think a lot of it's just the moodiness I'm digging, but it isn't fixated on the darkness. There's always some beautiful elements that come through. And on top of that, there's some really cool, spicy harmonic ideas as well, primarily from the lead guitar. And that they'll usually stick within the chord that we have from the the synthesizer. But they'll always pull in a few notes, little runs from an adjacent chord and bring in some of that jazzy spice. And I love it every single time it comes in. There's a couple of places where I'm like, oh, that's really dark. You brought in some, some very bizarre uh, uh, dissonance with that one. But usually I still enjoy it, even if I think it's a bit uh, nails on a chalkboard-ish. It's still, it's still interesting. It's still unexpected. But what I think I love most is that those moments are juxtaposed with that memorable melody, the chorus, so to speak. Every time it came back, I was like, oh, yeah, I know this section. I suppose it's a similar feeling to when, you know, the second, third time through we hear a chorus and we've picked up on a few of the words, even though it's the first time we've listened to it. And we try to sing along, missing a few words along the way, but, you know, we still really enjoyed it. It's already an earworm and we aren't even finished with our first listen through of this song. I kind of get that same feeling with this. It's just usually it's not surprising for a hook to be memorable for us to already be committing it to memory because that's the point of a, of a vocal hook. 
and uh, a lot of music has lyrics and they have memorable choruses. So it's kind of just like a, a de facto state for mainstream music with lyrical lines. And so when I hear it in, in an instrumental track, though, it's like a special thing kicks in where I have to vocalize it because I'm having that same feeling just in a new atmosphere, new context. And I think they did a fantastic job of creating this, well, it's a memorable hook. Right? It's a catchy chorus. We could have had this, was it last week we did catchy chorus week? Uh, and it never really dawned on me. You know, I think every single one of those songs we did was uh, a vocal chorus that was catchy. But yeah, you could absolutely do it instrumentally too. And I think Tatrin just absolutely nailed it with this track Evermore. And it really is that back and forth, I think, that sells it. We move into the unknown. We explore some interesting ideas, some phrasing that's kind of a little obtuse, linear writing from start to finish on these verses, um, some jazzy little ideas, all of it really beautiful, but kind of a, a varying scale of memorability, ease to follow, uh, and stuff like that. But no matter what, we'll always come back to this chorus and it's almost like a home, a recentering. It's catchy. It's an earworm. Uh, so far, I mean, it's it's two songs, right? Kind of got a 50-50 chance. But so far, Evermore is my favorite off, off this album so far. And I think a lot of it comes down to the contrast and the chorus and how that works together. Uh, and interestingly... This song continues on in ways that the no did as well. The whole concept of contrast being a primary driver for the song. We don't really hear too much of those really dark atmospheres that we got from the no, but there's still plenty of darkness here that's offset with brighter, uh, bouncier uh, melodies. I don't know what, what word I was looking for there, but we're going to land on melodies. Uh, and it is about the contrast between those two. In fact, even our lead melodic instrument, the guitar, ends up bringing in some tenser dissonance in its lines. It isn't always bright and bo and boppy, bright bright and bouncy like the no usually had their main melody be. But we still had this contrast between those two sides. It wouldn't surprise me if we continued along with that idea. We are twenty-ish percent done with the album at this point. That's not a big number, but it's also kind of a big number. And <laughs> twenty percent's not small. Um, but uh, you know, interestingly, this also sets up an idea that the no set up, which is not necessarily on contrast, but on expansion. However, Evermore explores expansion in a different way. The no did linear expansion of layers, continuously adding more ideas to expand upon and explore what. Uh, a section could be until we have fully exhausted what this section has in store for us. Starting off the surface level, adding more and more depth to it until we get to the end and we have heard the full version of that section. Evermore has more of a horizontal depth to it, where it's not so much of how many layers could this have, but what kind of ideas could we explore through it. And so we don't really get a lot of sections with more layers. It's more that we have a foundation, and then we will explore what we can do on top of that melodically. Return home, and then take a different path and explore that melodically. Return back to the starting point, home the chorus, and explore in a different direction this time and see where that takes us. And it sort of ends up being like three solos with choruses between them. I enjoyed that quite a bit. I, th I thought it was very cool to see them kind of take different stances too. As I mentioned, one of those sections, I think it was the second time through the verse, ended up being quite a bit darker as the guitar picked out some notes that carried a ton more dissonance than anything else we had really heard this album, aside from those final synth pads at the end of the no. But compared to the third verse, we didn't really hear much dissonance in there at all. 
Now that's not to say we don't have any layering going on in this track. We do hear some new things in the final minute or so, a couple of new ideas pop up, but uh, you know, for the most part, it is about building this foundation and then just exploring it in several directions rather than just going straight up and finding depth. Which actually reminds me about something. If you'll bear with me, we're going to circle back to the no a little bit. Both of these tracks are in 3-4. We don't really get any of that polyrhythmic stuff going on here. Or I should, it should be polymetric, I believe. Uh, because we did have those four beats, sorry, four hits per beat in the no. So you could count one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, it allowed it to have both a feeling of three and a feeling of four without moving into this, the familiar hemiola, which is a three against two pattern. Uh, this is more of a 12 against three, which is sort of a one against four, which it's not a really interesting pattern, but it does create this feeling where you can feel the uh, asymmetric groove of three or the symmetric groove of four, depending on that. And both of them carry drastically different tempos with them. The song can be felt in both ways, and I enjoy that. It creates another sense of extreme duality. You know, we talked about the lows of the no and the highs, the dark and the bright. We also have slow three and fast four. I didn't really caught on to that, uh, the parallels there when we originally went through that. But they 100% exist, and I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, something else about the no is timbres. We hear a lot of the same things here. We have synth, we have bass, drums, guitar. Uh, that's all of them, isn't it? Synth, bass, drums, guitar. But on the no, we had violins in a couple of places, and we had microtonal violin work as well. It sounded to me as if they were just constantly bowing and sliding down or up the neck of the instrument, catching all of the tones that sit in between the main notes that we use in the 12 tone scale. Um, we also have that sort of microtonality in Evermore, though I don't know how they achieved it, and I don't actually know if it is microtonal. Primarily just because there's a sense of dissonance at the end of the song that feels chaotic to me. I believe it's two guitars, acoustic maybe. It doesn't sound distorted or electronic. Uh, I suppose it could have been clean electric though. Uh, and they were both playing constant eighth notes, I think it was. And it was sort of all over the place. Very chaotic to me. But it didn't sound... It didn't sound chromatic. Maybe it was just in a key that sounds microtonal. I don't know. Microtonal sounds have a very unique texture to them. And that's what I felt here. But when I was listening, I couldn't really tell you that it was microtonal. So I think I'd need sheet music to say distinctly what is going on there. But they are playing around with tonality, if nothing else, in interesting ways to create these feelings of microtonal playing, even though I would probably wager we're not using any microtonal instruments. It's possible that the guitar they're using um, is fretless. Maybe the bass is also fretless, but I'm going to assume that the third person in the... Oh, there's only three people. How does that work? Bass, guitar, drums, synth. I count four instruments at most places in this track. Uh, we're going to check out Lovers next, which is the longest one on the album. And I think at that point we'll be a third done with the album. And I'll have a pretty good gist of what's going on. And so I'll look into some extra information. We'll look at the personnel list, see what kind of instruments are at play, who's playing what, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll look into the, uh, the interviews, see if I can't find any information from Tatran officially about this album just to kind of get a little bit more of that authorial intent, again, that we're missing from not having lyrics. But, um, yeah, 
the keyboard definitely is not microtonal. I mean, it, it, it's, it's possible, I suppose. There are microtonal keyboards out there. And there's actually some really cool microtonal instruments that are keyboard-like. But, you know, if you go into a store and you just buy a guitar and a bass and a keyboard, you're getting stuff that's 12 tones. So, yeah. I, I don't think that there's microtonal instruments at play here, which means that they're achieving a microtonal sound without it. And so you can still achieve slides on both instruments. I mean, keyboards have modulation wheels, they have pitch wheels, uh, guitars you can play between the frets if you want. So maybe that's how they're achieving. I don't know. But uh, their, their, harmon their harmonic elements can get very wonky at times, and I'm curious how they're achieving that on both of these tracks. Uh, although with the no, like I said, I'm pretty sure... Well, you know, I mentioned violins and sliding down the neck, but there probably isn't a violinist, so that's going to be a, a pitch wheel on the keyboard. That would be my guess. Again, I don't know the personnel, though. Maybe they do have a violinist in the group. I don't know, a trio, man. That is very limiting for how many layers they tend to have. I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, the last thing I think I'm going to touch on right here. Well, I mean, I thought I was going in a new direction, but it it's just an expansion on where I was. I wrote down uh, sparse harmonic tension. And this plays into how they go about writing melodies. They have really great ideas of narrative building both of these tracks you listen to the lead guitar in either of them and the guitarist just takes you on a journey really does beautiful pacing uh great movement it's not always just you know half notes and whole notes up or down there's some leaps as well it's it's a fully fleshed out tale both of these uh, uh lead melodies and there are those moments like i mentioned when we kind of pull outside of the framework of the chord and we find some stuff that's jazzier or darker brighter and what I love about these is one that you just never know when it's gonna happen the guitarist will just pull it out of nowhere and it's like yeah that was actually a perfect direction to go from here I love that little twist on the formula great idea but occasionally the guitarist will pull off something rather dark, real spicy, lots of dissonance. Sometimes it's just a quick little note or two to add that spice, to add that flavor to the melody. Other times though, only once or twice, very sparse, really leaning into the darkness of these lines. I think I brought this up with the no as well, but I kind of moved off of the topic rather quickly. But I love these little ideas. It's like reading a book. And you can kind of guess where the author might be taking the story. And then there's a twist. Catches you off guard, but dang, it is a good twist. And now you're hooked. Now you have to read another chapter. You were planning on being done. It's 1.30 in the morning, but you can't stop now. The author just hooked you back in. That's what those little moments were for me with the guitarist. Because if the guitarist didn't use those little moments, the little bits of spice pulling outside of, of the key that they're playing in, it would still be exceptionally competent, beautiful, easy to listen to music, but it would lack that thing that keeps me interested, that makes me wonder, what does this guy have up his sleeve? What What's around the corner here? He takes something that... I'm not going to say it's 100% predictable, but very palatable in a lot of ways and finds ways to keep it interesting without completely overpowering the song because we still need that balance. The atmospheres are the dark parts. The melodies are the light parts. That's how both of these songs have worked. And so it's just these little moments, little portions of weakness that change things up just a little bit. I love it. It's just, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous writing. Um, and to me, it's one of those things that elevates melody writing. It, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sticking within a key for melody writing, melody playing, whatever. Um, but everybody does it. And to me, if you want to really shock me, if you really want to tell me that you know what you're doing as a composer, 
you're going to color outside the lines a little bit and what you end up coloring is going to be so good. And I just love that idea. It's like when you watch those uh, YouTube videos and it'll be like a professional colorer or, or an artist or something and they'll go, go get like a kid's book, a kid's coloring book, and then they'll like completely change things up, add more lines, add depth and color and all this stuff. And you're like, dang, you know, the final product is so much better than anything could have been because they added to the original line work before they colored it. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me every time. As long as it's done well. I mean, there's definitely ways that you can color outside the lines and it just becomes a mess. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing harmonically. Or it's experimental, in which case you do know what you're doing and it's just too frictional for me. But, yeah, you give me something like this, especially two songs in a row, and I'm like, this dude knows what's up. He knows what he's doing. He's in full control of his melody writing. Um, and he knows exactly how he's pushing and pulling and crafting tension and, and leading the listener on this little story. The no could have been a fluke, but Evermore cements it as somebody who is well within their craft and is quite skilled at it. So, yeah, real strong stuff uh, for me. I'm, I'm enjoying all this. We're going to keep pushing forward. Next track is called Lovers. Like I said, it's the longest on the album. And then after that, I am going to pause the video for a second and allow myself to do a little bit of research on things before we push forward. But until then, let's see what they have in store for us with Lovers. For a second, I thought it felt kind of grungy, but then we ended up on a two chord loop. Well, it still does kind of feel grungy. Let's see where they go with this Nirvana light sound. wonky end to that line but with the, like the warble of the guitar tone that was a quick verse we're already back to this chorus <laughs> what in the world Oh, dude, I completely forget to bring up Flourish. Some tension on that string set. First song in four. Yeah, so six bars of four, 24 beat phrase, which is interesting because it's double the 12 that we've had on the last two. So they're still working with something that's just a hair bit odd, but it made more sense in the three. What? Dude, those really tight snare rolls that pop up every once in a while. Listen to the drums right here. Such odd rhythmic ideas and then still finding spaces for for rolls down the kit. It's just bonkers.
Dog's more interested in texture and atmosphere than the other two. <laughs> showing off. Yeah, showing off a bit more of the keyboard work. obtuse vocal lines than our other two tracks too. Might just be a coincidence, we have a different melody player. That's an interesting pattern to see, not this section, but the song as a whole. Dang, a very different song from the other two. The No and Evermore were about uh, setting a foundation and exploring it in two different ways. Lovers is linear. We explore new sections throughout this, which is what I was asking earlier. After the No, you know, I was like, shorter one, sure, I can see that, but seven minutes of one idea, can they keep me interested for that? We'll have to find out with track 7 and 8, which are a bit on the longer side. We'll see if they take inspiration from this and go for a linear format with, uh, with moving ideas. But right here, they said 7 minutes. We're going to need to... Uh, it's probably the inverse of this. But they probably didn't set out to make a 6 minute 47 second track and said, Oh, we should probably have some moving ideas. But with their longest track, it is not one that is as stagnant as the shorter ones so far. But I had mentioned that that's an interesting pattern that I picked up on in this track. It's called Lovers, and the whole time I was trying to figure out what that meant. I tried to do the same thing with the No and Evermore 2, and I came away with nothing, I'll be honest. <laughs> that's why I didn't bring it up. Um, but I did notice at least my relationship to this song mixed with a little bit of what they were exploring and I found a pattern. It starts out very exciting. In fact, in many ways, similar to Evermore and The No. We have a groove, we have an atmosphere, we have a melody. Pretty standard stuff. But we move from that into something more textural and rhythmic, atmospheric. Uh, and Well, in fact, even the rhythmic section tends or eventually we saw less of it until it was just textural and atmospheric. To me, this was a bit boring. It was a reduction of ideas and complexity down to uh, a bare bones concept of rhythm and harmony. I was waiting for 
something to be built on it, which I had been trained to do so for the past 10, 11 minutes now. You start with the foundation, you put something on top of it, and they never really got around to putting something on top of it. So I found this place to be sort of boring, static, baseline. From here, we entered into the chaotic synth solo with all of the dissonance and odd phrasing that was included there. And then the song just kind of ends fine, a bit more of a neutral feeling there. It isn't great. It's not super bright and bouncy, but it isn't as dull or chaotic as we uh, explored elsewhere in that track. And so to me, this kind of feels like the the natural growth of any relationship is you have your, your puppy dog years, the beginning of it. What do they call that? Puppy love? Uh, the honeymoon phase, though. When everything is bright and exciting and fun, everything's going great. Uh, then you kind of reach that point eventually, whenever this is in a relationship, of the mundanity of it. You know, it, it doesn't have that spark anymore, and this can sometimes lead to strife, negativity, getting into fights. And hopefully, after all of this, you sort of acclimate and learn how to live with each other. How, how to take the good with the bad and balance things out. And I think that's what the ending is supposed to represent. It kind of leading into something that's rather neutral. We go from exciting to boring to angry and chaotic to neutral. And while that's not the way that I think every relationship has to go, I think that typically is the learning pattern for a lot of people. Um, especially those, hopefully, hopefully those who uh, don't have a lot of experience in long-term relationships, uh, that they can make it through some of the less great sections and come out the other side um, kind of being okay with some of the more mundane or simpler parts of the, of the relationship and hoping that the two people can come to a type of... Uh, communication which I think is really key and so it's no longer about fights you talk about things before they blow up um again I don't know if that's what they were going for though we have no area of authorial intent here this is just my read on the track which is of course influenced by my own biases about relationships and the word lovers right there that word could mean something different to somebody else it could provoke different memories or ideas in them that they could attribute to the song but that's my take on it and that doesn't mean it's right it's just mine um so something i haven't really talked about much at all because i focus so much on melody and atmosphere writing here is the drum work which is consistently great. There's a lot of places where the drummer just sits in the groove. And I think that's what I focused on mostly, which is why I didn't really have much to say about them. But, uh, you know, I was listening to that track and I was pointing out all the places that the drummer's just absolutely doing some bonkers ideas, finding these tiny pockets of space somehow to throw four sixteenth notes of a snare roll in there and just the entire idea of the drumming groove in the second and third sections, which is just, what was the drummer on about? <laughs> Finding ways to make that six bar phrase even more obtuse than six bars of four, four already are. Um, the drummer just has a fantastic idea of drum work, melodic drum work. Um, and incorporates it in ways that are both positive and negative. Not that it makes the song good or bad, but that we have um, positive additives, which is where the idea expands upon what something is doing from a positive perspective. So expanding on positivity, expanding on happiness or brightness, um, but also areas where, like that six-bar groove, can utilize their, their drum phrasing and uh, drum ideas in order to expand upon those ideas of oddity within the, the already odd phrasing. It's not necessarily that the drumming disrupts anything that's going on in the song, but it always embellishes upon whatever the key 
factor is, whether that's a negative or a positive factor, the drummer knows how to lean into it and expand upon it. Um, and yeah, so like even within that song, there's just so many places where I'm listening, I'm like, dude, the drummer is on another level right here. It's not super flashy. We're not talking about somebody who like, I want to see them play because I can't even imagine what they're doing. But there's just so many little flourishes in the drum work, so many little ideas that elevate what's going on. The drummer always seems to have a keen insight into what the track needs at a specific moment and finds a way to rhythmically incorporate that in there in a way that maybe another instrument couldn't do. And I think that's really fantastic. Speaking of flourish, I've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but I've never brought up this specific concept. A lot of the melody writing tends to be flourishy. In fact, even on Evermore, where we continue to return to the chorus, an idea that we had heard three times by the end of the track, we had never heard each of those ideas in full. The first chorus was completely bare bones run through, mostly quarter notes and eighth notes. Though by the second time we're adding in little grace notes here and there. And a grace note is a note that you play before the note, not necessarily on any specific beat. You just kind of hit it before you hit your next one. So if your note is ba and your grace your grace note is ba, you might play ba da, ba da. You just kind of lean into it as quickly as you can. And it's really indicated quite <laughs> quite cute in sheet music it's just a little tiny note they kind of shrink the font on it by like i don't know 75 percent and it's just this tiny little note that's on the bar that you need to play to tell you what note it is but it's just like this super tiny note next to you know the normal note you'd expect that way you know it's not it doesn't go on the beat before it's just something you got to play before you get to the main note <laughs> Anyways, we get a lot of grace notes in there. We get little flourishes where we were holding out a note. Maybe we'll hold out the note half as long and then put a little um, little flare, little run at the end of it. Lots of cool little additions that by the time we got to the final chorus on Evermore, it was like a brand new section. There were so many new ideas going on. Um, and it was quite expanded, much like the no expanded the song layer by layer, this expanded the melody flourish by flourish. And I thought that was very cool, and we hear plenty of that here on Lovers as well. There's a lot of flourishy writing in the melody. It isn't always the way that Evermore does it, where we get more and more flourish, flourish as time goes on. But there is, I mean, pretty much the entire synth solo that we had in this one could be pared down to just the key notes, and it would have implied the same story. We just didn't have any of the, the runs going on between the ideas. Um, and which is interesting, because... Most of the melody writing so far has been mm, simple-ish. I don't want to say that anybody could pick up a guitar and do it, but I'm not the world's greatest guitar, and I feel like I could play some of these guitar parts, which, when y'all throw me some metal, that is that thought basically never crosses my mind. <laughs> now, simplicity isn't, isn't a bad thing, ever. And they do a lot of stuff with the, sim with the simple writing here because it's simple and effective. They know what they need to do and they're going for more of a minimal minimalistic approach to it. Um, but when it comes to some of these more flourishy sections, like that keyboard section, I'm just like, dang, this is, this is, this is beyond my skill now, which is cool. Uh, I like seeing that they know how to balance both of those that they can create something that's simple and effective. It doesn't lose its depth due to its simplicity, but they also have the chops and ability to write stuff that's more complex to really bring in some of that, uh, some, some of the interesting elements of speed. Because, like anything else, it's contrast. We had two songs so far in the first half of this third one that were a bit on the slower side. Really chill, simpler to play, smoother ideas, and Lovers decides to ramp that up a little bit, introducing speed and complexity. It is contrast not on a song level, but on an album level, allowing the pacing of the album to get shifted up a little bit and mixed around a bit. And I enjoy that. We also have the concept of groove here, which I have lightly touched on, but we had a really heavy groove section uh, I think it was our second or third section on this one. 
Super funky between the bass and the drums. Absolutely loved it. But groove has been sort of an element of all the tracks so far. And I haven't really talked about it because, again, I've been hyper-focused on melody and harmony so far. But I am enjoying the groove of this. Everything so far has been fairly laid back. I don't really feel like I have to move my body too quickly to, to move with the song. But, uh, yeah, they're all super great and the cool thing is too is it's not all straightforward groove uh it was oh it was the the four note tapping oh no no it was the the syncopated idea off of the left guitar on the no that sort of introduced this that was a bit funkier evermore was more straightforward but lovers has that super funky section about halfway through and it, it's cool again it's just contrast i like both of the ideas in isolation I love that they're presented on this album back to back in the ways they are. It, it's one of those things you just get a little bit of surprise. Oh, oh, I mm, got that funky syncopation in here. Where'd that come from? I don't know, but I'm loving it. That kind of idea. And uh, it just hits harder because I wasn't expecting it. So, yeah, real great stuff. This song does do something that the other two haven't yet. And it's not just in the structure. We hear a lot more keyboard here, assuming that the string instruments, the chimes, most of the non-rock based sounds have been synthesizer based, which I'm not sure about that yet, but it is an assumption I'm making at the moment. We haven't really heard too much of the keyboard as a lead instrument. Some synth pads in the background, some violins as ornamentation, some chimes to wrap a song up, but no, 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 nothing really in the spotlight, huh? And I think it's interesting because this song specifically not only gives us a keyboard solo, so the keyboard gets to shine for like 45 seconds or so, but there's also a ton of ornamental ideas in here that also play around with production that puts a larger spotlight on the synthesizer the electronic side of the songwriting maybe it's not necessarily the spotlight most people think of which is a lead melody but it is a spotlight because it becomes this main quality of the song listen to all of these different timbres listen to the bouncing around the panning of concepts um the opening minute of this song, give or take, was just the keyboardist going off with so many different samples that they had um, and, and incorporating it all into something that felt seamless rather than just this raw display of noise. Um, I thought that was pretty awesome because up until this point, aside from a couple of synth pads, there's nothing that really felt exclusively electronic. Like I mentioned, yeah, maybe the chimes and the, the violins and the strings Knowing it's a trio, I can say, okay, it's probably, you know, str uh, the, the keyboardist. But without no having that knowledge, I could guess that they were all real players, which would leave the keyboard, you know, the distinctly electronic sounds sparsely utilized. And it's this song that says, actually, we have a lot of these distinctly electronic sounds in here. And it gives me a chance to say, okay, this is the, the keyboardist going off. Let me see what they have. Um... And so, like I said, I just found it to be interesting that there is a, a heavier electronic vibe to at least the first third, first quarter of this track that we haven't really heard elsewhere. The first part of this song I would distinctly call an electronic track, whereas with the other two songs, I kind of, like, is this rock? Is this electronic? I'm not really sure. Um, and this one distinctly said, hey, the keyboardist is here. They've got some production stuff. They're playing around with sounds. Yeah, electronic, right? And so I appreciate uh, that, just allowing them to shine a little bit. The only other instrument I think that needs a little bit of spotlight here is the bass. And we do get a little bit of those moments in this track where the guitarist will pause their melody line and the bass will come in and finish off an idea or start the next idea, just kind of fill in that space that the guitarist isn't playing. I really liked moments like those. I think the bassist has some chops based off of the few lines that I've heard there. We just haven't had a moment where the bass has been in the spotlight for an extended period of time yet and i'd love to hear some because i think the bassist is good for it um and it's a good tone too just a nice meaty tone it's not as punchy as uh, progressive rock basses tend to be it is kind of flatter and blunter it, it 
just kind of fills a lot of space rather than being this pointed bop, 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 this like punchy sounds. But it's, uh, it's good. It fits the vibe of the band. And, you know, could be like a guitarist too and switch over to a lead tone when they need it. You know, that's always a possibility. You just don't see that too often. I've brought that up a couple of times. It still confuses me. Why do guitarists feel like they have to have a lead tone and a rhythm tone and a solo tone and a tone specifically for this song and a reverby tone and they got like switch between them all on the fly and they've got like massive amounts of pedals in front of them and setups and presets and the basis is like I've got my amp and my cab I've got my tone dialed in is this this is what I play for the whole show Give me bassists that have presets and different tones. I want to see that become a staple in the realm of rock and metal and even whatever this is, which I think it actually makes more sense here to kind of expand upon that, especially since there is this electronic component to it. Play around with your sound, man. I don't know. I think I'm ranting about stuff that doesn't mean anything for Tatron specifically. So let me take a break here, do a little bit of reading and uh, we'll come back and discuss a little bit about the band and maybe their ethos, anything I could find about them, and particularly, hopefully, some answers about this album. All right. There's not a lot on the internet about this group. Bandcamp, they have a, uh, what do you call this, a little description of themselves. Says that they're an eclectic Tel Aviv based instrumental band with musical influences that range from jazz, avant garde, post rock, and experimental. That their previous releases were warmly received throughout the world and soared to the top of Bandcamp's popularity and best selling charts, which is pretty cool. I've never heard of them, but uh, apparently they're pretty big on Bandcamp. But other than that, I have very very little uh, information about this. I do have a personnel list. It just says arranged and performed by the three members. I would probably mispronounce her name, so I'm going to omit that. Uh, but there are some string offerings by somebody else. Tracks 1, 4, and 6 were composed by that same person who played the strings. Tracks 2, 5, and 9 were composed by somebody else. Track 8 was composed by a combination of those two people. Tracks 3 and 7 were, co were composed by a combination of those two people and one of the performers of Tatrin. There is a cello and violinist uh, listed as well. But I do think it's interesting that it says that the these three people, they don't compose their music. They arrange and perform it. 1, 2, th 3, 4... Five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, all nine tracks are composed by somebody else. And I think that's really interesting. You don't hear about that too often in the rock sphere of people playing music that they didn't write. It's very typical in uh, pop. It's typical in classical. It's typical in jazz. But in rock, there's this, there's this ownership thing. Yeah, I'm playing this music, but I also wrote it. You just don't see that too often. I can only think of a couple of bands who have a composer who's not in the performing group. It is a, a huge rarity. Um, <clears throat> even more so in the electronic realm of things. So, yeah, that's peculiar. I like it, though. I really do. I'd like to see more of it. Um, but... I just don't think it's that big of a thing. It, it just it will never become popular, especially in the rock field, of playing somebody else's music. Uh, and the, the couple of times that it does come out, it's a negative. It's like, yeah, they don't even write their own music. Like, it's this, it's this bad thing to know what you're good at <laughs> and to hire somebody to help uh, who can fill in those blanks. It's like, yeah, we're really good at playing drums and guitar and singing, but... We tried to make some songs and it's garbage. Let's get a composer. Like that sounds like a normal thing to do. Uh, and yet the, the rock and metal realms are just very antagonistic about it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's generally about all the information I found. The one other piece of information I found was interesting was that according to Spotify, a vast, vast, vast majority of listeners live in Israel. They're really not heavily listened to outside of Israel. Um, although, 
they really only show the top five locations. And while that does make up a majority of their monthly listeners, it doesn't paint the whole picture. So it's not to say that people only listen to them from Israel. Um, just that at the top, the top biggest cities are all Israeli cities. And there's a lot of listeners in the in those five cities um, that make up a large percentage of the people who do listen to them through Spotify. As their Bandcamp description stated, they are really big on Bandcamp. So, I have no further insight into their music. I have no insight into the instrumentation. Um, I do know that they have a guitar, bass, drums, and then electronic, but I have no idea who plays what. And it's possible, the way that I hear four lines at most points in time, that we do have a bassist, a guitarist, and a drummer, and the electronic stuff is programmed. Maybe they have um, touring musicians who play the keyboard stuff with them live. Uh, maybe it's like a drum track. You just hit space bar and you play the song and the electronic music goes on its own. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, there's usually four lines going on in the music and there's three musicians. Not sure how that works live. But I have no answers on to their ethos for this album, what they're trying to do or explore. So, we'll just keep pushing on. We're going to check out the next track. We come back to something a bit shorter, looking at just four and a half minutes with candies. See what's going on with this one. Alright, so we have building and layering. Push into the offbeats. This is continuing on with some of the esoteric choices of lovers. Interested to see where they develop this. The transitory ideas are neat, with concepts that will get very sparsely in order to introduce a new line, such as that synth thing that we had. Oh, actually that synth line we had is now in these, what is that, muted guitar? It's that rising line. See what I mean about the bass guitar? You can hear pretty solidly here. It's just a very wide, flat tone. It takes up a lot of space. that neat little sound to go along with changes it makes the harsh transitions feel a little less harsh see in contrast too this is a gorgeous section with very traditional melodic and harmonic work Very different from the obtuse ideas we heard on the previous two minutes of this song. That sound like they're returning.
see we've sort of pulled back out of the ab oh. Still some really spicy harmony in here. Really wide, fuzzy lines coming in, production-wise. Very dissonant harmony here. Yeah, I think this is going to be a quick little one. This is an interesting decision here. Primarily from the perspective of the album. Let's start with what Candies is, though, and then we'll expand from there. Yeah, this is a noisy song. Not necessarily in a bad way, but there's just a lot of ideas here that I don't think are necessarily working harmoniously with the other ideas. Um, in a way that promotes... A positive connectivity between all of them. Many of the ideas in here are obtuse harmonically. We have a lot of combinations of sounds, dyads and triads, that create tension and dissonance. We heard it right there at the end with those final dyads. That could be felt throughout a majority of this song. Many of the instruments were playing notes that just were not working positively with the notes from the other instruments and so we end up with a lot of tension a lot of dissonance a lot of spicy harmony throughout here but also some straight up dissonance not just spicy harmony but words uh, words notes actively working against the notes around them and creating massive disruption on the, uh, the sound wave level it is obtuse is really the best word I have for it. Sometimes they'll they'll line up and be like, okay, that's going in a direction that makes sense. And usually that'll be immediately followed up by something that is just a mess of, of note combinations, note intervals. This is often paired with odd rhythmic phrasings. We're in 4-4 four, four from a majority of this, but the accent points are sort of all over the place from not just our lead instruments but also the drums giving us well it's not really a backbeat is it it's it's kind of difficult to follow there's a lot of really quick hits usually an and of and then a downbeat but that's not always consistent either and the downbeat isn't always following a standard pattern either we, even just from the very beginning of the song we start with emphasizing downbeats and it only took 30 seconds before we had an instrument emphasizing the offbeats creating this poly instrumental it's not i guess kind of a hot kit right maybe i don't know it's just it was all over the place and a lot of it is these short staccato notes even when you look at individual instrument melodies what they're playing what notes they're bouncing between the collection of notes they're playing doesn't always make a lot of sense in consonant harmony it, there's just there's a disruptive nature to almost every line in here rhythmically harmonically melodically I'd say that most of it kind of makes sense as far as pitches I, I separated from harmony if you can do that the the movement and flow of melodies generally works fine it's still kind of bouncy and leapy in places where we will just jump have these big jumps between pitches but I'd say that on the whole the melody is probably the most forgiving element in here as far as listenability everything else is working against the listener enjoying the track i think at least from a palatability angle that's not to say that you can't enjoy this but it definitely misses a lot of the consonant harmony and understandable rhythms that you typically find in palatable music Put in another way, if you just took some general mainstream music listener off the street, they would probably find some stuff in the No or Evermore that they could enjoy, but I think they'd have a real tough time enjoying candies. This runs in drastic opposition to everything else 
on this album. So looking at it from a pacing perspective, we have the No and Evermore, which feel like two sides, or two of the same sides of a coin. They're very similar to one another, and the and then Lovers comes in and feels like an expansion of on those ideas. Actually, no, the No and Evermore are two sides of the same coin, right? One was vertical depth, one was horizontal depth. Yeah, two sides of the same coin there. And then Lovers comes in and changes things up a little bit. Introduces a little bit more tension and dissonance than either of those did. Heavier focus on the electronic side of things, while also presenting a linear narrative through a series of ideas, rather than just a single A section, or the A, B, A, B, A, B that Evermore presented. And then Candies comes in and just disrupts all of that and says we're just going to be noisy for four minutes and I hope you're okay with that because we just gave you you know 15 16 minutes of fairly palatable linear writing you know so it is a good time I think to introduce something new to the table and Candies does that did I enjoy it hmm no, not not generally. Uh, I think it's a fine track if you enjoy this sort of noisier atmosphere. I found very little in it that I enjoyed listening to, though. I can appreciate from an artistic angle, though, particularly looking at the album as a whole and the pacing of it. Like I mentioned, now is a good time to change things up on track four, having finished with Lovers, the longest track I don't know that this is necessarily the change I would have wanted, though, but, you know, albums don't have to please me, artists don't have to please me, and uh, this is definitely a choice, and obviously one that people are fine with. When I look at this album, um, well, this isn't the least, actually, I was going to say this isn't the least listened to track, but on the whole... Other than track 7's Bleach, the plays just consistently dip the further into the album. So that seems to me, at least, to be a pattern that's less about enjoying the later tracks less and more about just never finishing albums. It could be that people just generally get their fill of the album after only listening to a few tracks. Or people end up listening to the first few tracks, get distracted, have to stop listening to it, and they don't like picking back up where, where they left off, so they start it over again. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, I'm not going to say that this is less enjoyed because it doesn't have as many plays as the first few. Uh, because it just, is, it, it just decreases every track. Um... Anything else I want to add to this? Yeah, I know mean, that's my big thing is that it's obtuse. There is one big thing to it. And, you know, everybody say it with me. Contrast. That's what Tatron does really well. And we do have a contrasty B section in here. Where we engage with more consonant harmony, uh, warmer atmospheres, long held out notes rather than a series of many short staccato ideas. It is something a bit more traditionally palatable, and it feels more inviting and less cold to me. And of course, it's short-lived so that we can return back to the obtuse writing of the beginning to wrap the song up. Um, you know, it's... It's a song. <laughs> uh, but what I do like is that if we look at the a chart of palatability the no i think is pretty high evermore is pretty high lovers has moments of palatability they have moments of strong palatability they have moments of low palatability but generally we're all here and candies kind of takes those lower palatable elements of lovers and says well what if we just do a whole song of that and really tanks the palatability element in the graph I'm curious then if our next track, Fish's Tears, is going to ramp things back up and we're going to explore something hyper palatable, or if we're just going to stick in this area. I think it would be interesting to see the album return back to a, a sort of mixed feeling like we have in the first two tracks. It makes more sense to me to swing to extremes here so that we can return to some, uh, a return to form by the end of the album. But, uh, you know, those kind of thoughts definitely come in, what are they called, afterwards, in hindsight. So, you know, making albums, putting 
tracks together, it's difficult. It really is to find the right way to order your tracks. And, you know, even when you're making the album, you'll probably go through like six or seven different lists of ordering. Unless it's a narrative story. you got a concept album that's totally different. <laughs> but there's no right way to do it either. And once you've shifted, you might even change your mind about things then. But it's already out there in the open now. So you can't do anything at that point. Anyways, we're going to push forward. I think we're going to check out the next two tracks back to back since they are on the shorter side. In fact, they are the two shortest songs on the album. After that, we'll hit the second longest in isolation. And then maybe the last two combined. It really depends on if, I have, yeah, if I have a lot of thoughts for track eight. So the next one is called Fish's Tears and we will follow that up with Seth. A lot of compression. We got some crackling going on. Very smooth though. There's some intonation thing. keyboard I can't tell if we're playing notes that are just tense together or if there's slight intonation things going on because the tension is so minute but it gets stacked on all six of the notes which makes it feel as tense as it is beautiful yeah I love that transition idea oh a little bit of mystery yeah Really loving the drum groove too. Yeah, the dynamic qualities. Wah 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 wah. Getting the the volume rise and release. Oh, the heartbeat in the bass. Da dun 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 dun. Yeah, tense and mysterious. That's what they're going for here, and they're absolutely nailing it. I love the orchestral element with the strings. wish we would have more string playing but honestly the choices that they pick are so good that it makes up for sort of missing them in other sections oh we got some crazy polyrhythm on the height symbol over here See, the bass, man. It's not punchy, it's just sort of flat here. Yeah, those tight little snare rolls. So good. Sticking with a little bit of this mysteriousness. Very 
very keyboard centric. We have bass and drums, but no guitar yet. Great attention for the production to achieve the right vibe alongside the harmonic qualities. Switch up the beaches to hair. Okay. A little early for the B section. Maybe they're just gonna drag it out a little bit. Maybe they got some place to go with it. No, bringing it back. They still, man, the song's barely half over though. That synth pad getting louder and then wiping out to just create this pocket of emptiness on top of the song, yeah. Interesting to see more laid-back drumming on this one. We, we have that one switch up, but everything else is very much about being in the pocket. Oh, a hyper-reverbed version of our bridge to wrap this up. Interesting. That's also interesting too. That went right up to the end, whereas most of the tracks have pretty long uh, silences. Many of them at least two seconds, though. I think it was uh, Candies it was almost eleven seconds long for um, the distance between its fade out and the end. And the part of that, like three or four seconds, was uh, silence. So yeah, this is the only song that had me question. Oh snap! Are we gonna? transition into the next track because I don't in this case I don't want to do that but every other song's been very clear here's the end here's some silence the next track is definitely you know next uh well it, it's definitely separate I should say of course the next track is next it's, it's, it's in the word man next anyways um yeah so I, I feel like both of these songs much like the uh the no and evermore uh, Fish's Tears and Seth are two sides of the same coin. We get to find two heavily atmospheric, both of them sort of myster mysterious to their atmospheres. Um, both of them felt very smoky to me, too. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. It's one of those weird visual things I have with music. Um, but they achieve it in two drastically different ways. Um, I want to start with Seth here because... I literally just listened to it, so it sounds like a good place to start. Um, we do have a catchy little do 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 very catchy melody. And this is what I was talking about with Evermore. Sometimes their guitar riffs are just yeah, if you put words to them, they would absolutely be earworms for most people. Um 
just super catchy idea. His song's over, you can still hum it. You can still hum the the melody along, and it's on top of such a light, laid back groove. The bass, rather simple, kind of following along with the bass kick. The drums, simple, laid back, sitting in the pocket. There's a couple of sections where he kind of changes from emphasizing, I think it's one and three to two and four, or maybe it's the inverse of that. Uh, we just shift our accent points though. But other than that one little pocket of oddity, the drums are super simple. Sitting in the pocket, they're designed to be that human metronome. They're not trying to be spicy or playful or, or show off any skill or anything like that. The drums are there to keep time in a majority of this track, which is very different. Almost every other song on this album, the drums have done a lot of showing off. And so with the synths giving us our chord progressions, giving us this um, sort of, uh, like I said, smoky mysteriousness, um, and then this, this, very laid back, simple drum work. A lot of the song leans on the melody writing. And I feel like the melody here feels very slinky, very like back to the wall, shimmying along, trying not to get spotted. That's what Seth feels like to me for some reason. Um, it's very quiet, very low key. It's something that can easily drift into the background for me. And not many sections in it at all, other than our bridge and eventually the reverbed bridge that we used at the ending, none of them really call attention to themselves. This is a song that if it were at a party or a gathering or something would be something that I think most people won't even hear. It's part of that background noise. Um, and I find that really interesting about it for as many tracks as we had for candies, which tried so hard to say, look at me, listen to me, hear all this obtuse stuff. Um, listen to the dissonance. Like there's so much in there that's, that's attention seeking. Seth just doesn't have that. This is a track that feels like it just wants to be forgotten. It wants to be wallpaper, musical version of wallpaper. And so that's where we do get a lot of the diminished elements of spotlighting. The drums don't play as fancy as they usually do. The harmony is rather consonant most of the time. The volume, while it is still full volume, doesn't sound very loud. It all feels laid back, chill, quiet, and again, smoky. I don't know, that just feels like the right word for it. Of course, we do have the bridge which is this really big, I think, a tom roll, but it might just be a snare without the without the uh, snare beads enabled. It's just, it's a very drum heady kind of sound. Um, and it's very big and booming. Part of that I think is production, but part of me also think it's one of the larger toms, maybe even the floor tom. It's just the pitch sounds off, but you can always tune the tom too. I don't know. There's There's something going on there. It's very booming. It's very big. All the other instrumentation so far has been calm, chill. Then this production is large. What I find is interesting, though, is we don't do anything with it. I even asked myself, you know, this is early for the bridge. We had barely hit halfway through. We still had like a minute and a half to go. We don't usually hit the bridge this early because their bridges have historically been short. A little 30 second bridge to add in some contrast before we return to form. We saw this on Fish's Tears. We saw it on Candies. Uh, you know, we saw it on Evermore. Well, no, Evermore is ABAB. It was the, the no. You, you play your song for like up to the 60% and then you do a couple of seconds, you know, 30 seconds or so of this new idea and then you finish out returning to form. Maybe with a variation on it. That's what Tartran, uh, Tatran has been doing this whole time. And so we get to the midpoint, a bit early for this, and we enter to it. And I'm like, okay, maybe they're going to build off of it. They're giving themselves more room for this. And then they don't. <laughs> we just kind of sit here with this booming drum idea. And then we go back to the old stuff. It feels more out of place than some of the other bridges. And also less meaningful. This one feels more of, well, this is what we do. More so than this is what the song demands. 
What I did like, though, was that they utilized this as a bit of foreshadowing, which I suppose does sort of work. After returning to form, we end the song coming back to the section with a ton of reverb on this rolling drum idea. It's neat, and I like the callback. Do I think it really made the end of the song great, though? I don't know. Does it justify the bridge in the middle? Again, I I don't know. I like the callback, but both times it just kind of felt a bit flat. Again, it feels more of like this is what they do. We write songs, and then we do a counter to it for contrast, and then we go back to what the original song was. And it just didn't feel like it came together here on Seth. However, Fish's Tears is different. This one achieves some of the smokiness through tension, a different type of harmonic uh, resolution and resonance, but also what I think more importantly, what stands out to me is string uses, expanded orchestration. This one also feels kind of mysterious and sneaky, um, but where Seth kind of feels like uh, lounge music, Fish's Tears feels like suspense music. It feels like something you would hear in a Mission Impossible or James Bond song, or film, or whatever. James Bond plays music, right? <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, you'd think that'd be a skill. Right? You gotta be like one of the top agents. You gotta have a lot of skills to let you blend into places. Why have we never seen James Bond play the piano? That'd, that'd be a really good way to blend into some high society is be the pianist. Right? Anyways. Uh, yeah, Fish is Tears, man. It feels suspenseful. And a lot of that comes down to the harmonic resonance. Uh, the chord progressions that we have. But again, I think the real strength of this is the string orchestration. It's not just the laid back drumming. It's not just the dark and moody chords, but it's also having more than just the bass giving us a bass line, usually a foundational idea, sometimes a couple of flourishy ideas and a melody on top of that, which is what most of the songs are. This allows the strings to come through and provide counterpoint and provide larger harmonic devices where we don't just have a chord from the guitar and uh, you know, a bass usually playing a root note, but we can have more chords. We have two more instruments. We have two more pitches we can add to it. And yeah, I mean, it's a guitar, right? You can play, well, presumably up to five, well, more than that. Because if you like bar chord, you can play a lot of notes at once. It's <laughs> what I'm getting at. Uh, so you're like, hey, well, you know, what's, what's two more notes? But no, like you can have pitches that are bonkers far apart. Um, stuff that would be really difficult, if not impossible, to do on the guitar. Just, you know, human physiology. Our pinky doesn't stretch and, and contort. We're not Mr. Fantastic. So just having the ability to play those two extra notes wherever they want to be is, like, massive. And it, it allows us to have this expanded chordal element to the track and makes it feel larger than I think any of the other songs do. We don't ever get to have a song that has... Uh, the additional instruments used like this. Um, Evermore was probably the, I think it was Evermore, no, it was the No. It was probably the closest. And it's just, you know what, we really haven't used any of the strings in a while. And I think that's a big missed opportunity. Because I love their harmonic elements here. I love the way that they build chord progressions when they can have these expanded chords. It gives it depth in a way that you just don't hear in other places on this track. And that additional depth allows it to um, kind of dig its feet in and give you a stronger pulse of the emotion they're going for, which for me, it's, it's the mystery. But I also think that violins are just a really good timbre for mystery, too. Um, and it ends up feeling fantastic. Um... We also have a neat little thing here, which is polyrhythm. Towards the end of the track, we had our 4-4 laid down, but we had a ride cymbal doing something else. I'm not sure what it was. 
I didn't get a chance to figure it out before the song was over, but I thought it was really neat just to have that bonus little thing. It also allowed the drummer to introduce some more complex ideas rhythmically, and it just fills out the back end of this track. It evolves in a way that, now that I think about it, Seth didn't. And maybe that's... Well, that's the contrast, isn't it? I said Fish's Tears and Seth were two sides of the same coin. I got kind of lucky listening to them back to back. Um, but I do think that that kind of hurt my overall enjoyment of Seth, too. I kind of wish they were ordered oppositely. Getting the more simple concept of the moody, smoky song, and then the more complex, in-depth one. Because I do like that idea of contrast on the album to show two songs that are handling similar vibes but do so in drastically different ways. And in a sense, if they had done it in the opposite direction, the movement from Seth to Fish's Tears could feel like a glow-up of this type of atmosphere. I think that would have been awesome. But as it stands, I got to hear a fully realized version of this smoky, uh, mysterious song. And then I got to hear a simplified version of it. And I don't think Seth is any worse off for being more simple. It's just in contrast to, and literally just before it, I heard a very similar song hit on, for me, a better wavelength because it incorporated more of the ideas I like that they're good at. And they good. They are good at writing some of the more simpler ideas. In fact, I've praised some of their more simpler writing on this album already. It's just here, it just kind of stands out a little bit in a way that maybe if there was a few songs between the two tracks, I'd be a little bit more forgiving of it. And be like, oh yeah, we're returning back to this. And if it's simpler, that's fine too, because now I'm working off of my memory of Fish's Tears rather than directly comparing it to what I literally just listened to. But back to back, Seth probably should have come first and we could have had that glow up. But, you know, also album phrasing, pacing. What does, what, what will Bleach look like? Track seven. Would that be something that we want to build into? Or is Fish's tears coming into Seth and kind of reducing the building blocks going to help us lead into the next track? So there's always that, too. I'm looking at this specifically in, you know, microscopic lens on the micro level. If I just look at tracks five and six, I think they should be reversed. But if I pull that mic, that... I was going to say microphone. If I pull the, the, the scope back a little bit and look at the bigger picture... Maybe this order works better when I take the whole album in. So, let's move on. Let's check out Bleach. This is their second longest track at uh, 6 minutes and 22 seconds. Let's see what they're doing with this one. If they take on a similar vibe to Lovers, where it's a, a linear approach, because this has been a return to form. Candies was sort of all over the place, but it did sort of function within a um, ABA pattern. The, the bass line, the contrast, and return back to the bass idea. Uh, and then Fish's Tears and Seth return back to the single concept that we saw with the No and Evermore. So it's very possible Bleach will attempt another linear story. Anyways, I'm rambling, and instead of saying what's going to happen, we can just Explore it. So let's dive into Bleach. Oh, so we start with a slower 3 4, and we pick it up into a faster 4 4. Very funky bass idea too. A very noisy guitar, a lot of compression on that. But it's also, it cuts out the low end and it pierces through in kind of a screechy kind of way. I'm not a fan of. Get some Primus energy from that. Oh, oh, what? I 
<laughs> the guitar just doing kind of whatever it wants rhythmically over here it does still remind me of Primus though. The funky bass line helps with that. Going back to some of Candy's more obtuse ideas with this melody writing. There's lots of cool poly rhythmic ideas though. We have multiple moving lines. There's a lot of cool concepts on paper, but the implementation of them are very noisy. And that leaves me in a point, a point of uh, enjoying it from arm's reach. Now is this a diversion? Oh, we're building off of it. Okay, let's go. Is that fifteen sixteen? Maybe that is 4-4. Four, four. I don't know. It's close. It is definitely an obtuse idea though. All the spaces, the odd phrasing, the accents. The drummer popping off though. Yeah, that's not 4-4. Four, four. It's a 15 beat phrase, but I'm not sure if it's 15 eighth notes or 15 sixteenths. The drummer's done doing metronome stuff. The drummer just started going off. He's like, whatever. Oh, the cymbals are going across the bars, though. The cymbals are laying down a 4-4, four, four, but... The rhythm doesn't match that because it's shorter. Very cool ending. Let's 
see this one has a lot of silence. At least five seconds, but close to like eight of fade out. So yeah, I enjoyed that. More so than I would th would have thought, especially based off of the beginning. It is noisy. It is dissonant. It has a ton of hurdles, I think, as far as its listenability goes. But it's also really funky and fun, and I kind of want to learn how to play it. That rhythm itself is uh, the final rhythm there at the end was very cool. Bum 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 chica bum bum bum. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, it's meaty, it's got punch, it's got presence, and it's also close to 4-4, but not. And what I really love, too, is that we got the crash symbol there at the end, and the crash symbol continues to lay down this 4-4 quarter note idea. Um, and so I'm listening to that, I'm like, okay, maybe it is 4-4, four because four, you know, I was kind of tossing it up and back and forth a little bit there. But no, no, the, uh, <laughs> the rhythm itself gets off kilter with that and begins to accent between the crash cymbal hits where originally it was accenting on the crash cymbal hits. So no, there's, there's a missing beat there. Uh, I would, I'd put money down that we're probably looking at 15 eighth notes there. So two bars of four, four, a bar of four, four, and then a bar of seven, eight. No, that's not right. A bar of 4-4 four, four, and then a bar of 7-8. That There we are. Uh, and alternating that. Um, although the 4-4 four, four can be separated into 8-8. Eight, eight, and then you have alternating 8 and 7, which gives you the 15. Um, math and music. <laughs> but yeah, so like that's a super funky section. And I love, love how that crash symbol comes in and lays that down so that we can feel the proper 4-4 four, four of the the section I guess but with the 15-8 idea also presented around it and feeling how that crosses over the bar I mean that's some big polymetric stuff right there and I'll be honest I never caught on how that resolved itself because a 16 beat phrase and a 15 beat phrase they're going to take a long time until they naturally resolve. So there's something happening probably at the end of every second run through that phrase that uh, they artificially line things back up. Maybe they add an extra, I guess it'd be a, a beat and a half to get things back up. Uh, oh no, we took away an eighth. So we just need to add two eighths, which would be a quarter note. Yeah, so you just add a quarter note to it the second time through, which might actually be where that expense expanded drum fill comes from yeah that's probably it right there yeah see it's it's under so many layers though and there's so much going on um and that that symbol section actually threw, threw me off a little bit the first time around but I, i've come to enjoy it the whole thing is just kind of bonkers um very noisy but also dang super groovy i love it the whole ending and the build up into it i thought was nice too which is where some of my palatability comes in on this. The first couple of minutes on this track were very rough for me. I'm not going to say I enjoyed them. It was giving me flashbacks to Candies where I'm like, okay, I get what you're doing. And I guess it kind of fits uh, on the, the pacing of the album. You definitely have this noisier side to your work and you're wanting to explore it. And that's fantastic. But yeah, this is not my cup of tea. Um... And, and I, I'm, I'm ready for it to be done with. And to be fair, we got into some really noisy stuff there at the beginning with timbres. We had some really interesting electronic sounds coming in there. Playfulness of production, placement of instruments, panning, and all sorts of stuff like that. We had many layers going off at once. Harmonically, we were all over the place. Lots of dissonance and tension going on there. It, and noisy is the only way I can describe it concisely. But I honestly don't think the end of the track would have worked so well without that. And it's just a fantastic way to set up the expectations for how the song is going to expand and grow. And then to rein it in and say, you know, this is unfiltered noise. This is just, you know, all this 
general sound here and we're going to shrink it down and compress it down into something that's very song like we're not going to lose that we're not going to shave off the rough edges and make it palatable and harmonious and stuff like that we're still going to keep some of the noisier elements to it the timbres of the instruments are still going to be a bit fuzzy and, and contorted um, you know, harmonically, we're still going to have some tension in here. We're still going to have some dissonance. It's still going to be a noisy track. We're just going to hone down this scattershot approach into something more focused and refined and feeling the song kind of rain in and take control of something so chaotic at the beginning and then manipulate it and turn it into something so awesome by the end that is still by all accounts rather chaotic but just razor focused it knows what it's trying to do and and utilizes the chaos to employ a specific vibe and feeling rather than a series of concurrent vibes and feelings it was just a phenomenal experience and I think that's what makes the ending work so well for me is because of everything that came before it. It's watching the evolution of this sound, getting rid of the stuff that's, uh, you know, a bit way out there and utilizing the stuff that's working well and kind of spreading that out and making everything gel a little bit better to create something noisy and chaotic. Haven't really talked much about... Uh, titles, Lovers was the only one I really went into with this, but, uh, yeah, how does, how does Bleach relate to this? <laughs> that's, that's how I'm feeling. Who's Seth for track number six? Four candies? Uh, yeah, I don't really relate any of that to candy, but candy is a, you know, it's a dopamine thing. It's sugar. It's, it's feel good. Uh, track four didn't feel very good to me. It was kind of noisy and chaotic, so... I mean, to to this moment, Lovers is still the only one that makes any sense to me. And I'm kind of figuring that Cross Lives and Melting Glass are probably going to be rather similar in that I have no idea about any thematic resolution between, uh, sorry, thematic resonance between titles and songs. Now, one thing that I meant to bring up prior to Bleach, but actually works really well here is a nice little thing to talk about is... Uh, I wrote down intonation. This is something I've brought up a couple of times that I don't know if they're playing notes between the notes or if the instruments are just slightly out of tune. Bleach leans into this a little bit, although I still think that Seth and Fish's Tears are the best examples of this type of harmonic approach. But there's a lot of times, especially in the last 12 minutes or so of music that we've checked out with tracks 5, 6, and 7, where I feel like there's dissonance, but it's not harmonic dissonance. That is to say that we're not getting uh, clashing sound waves because the notes that we're picking to play clash, but we're getting clashing sound waves because we're playing the right notes, we're just playing the right notes a little wrong. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of some music science here. Um, so music is sound waves. I think that one is uh, pretty typical. And uh, based on properties of the sound wave, I don't know specifics about this, but different pitches have different properties of the sound waves. And I think as your pitch gets higher, the space between the waves so like follow my finger if you will something like this which has a lot of space between the waves would be a lower note and something like this where the uh the lines are rather close is going to be a higher note i think that's accurate but it might be a different property so don't don't come at me <laughs> telling me i'm totally wrong i mean yes if i'm wrong correct me so i don't make the mistake in the future but uh, I don't remember if it's that or if it's the length of the sound wave. One of the two, though, will tell you um, the pitch. And so when you're playing notes, they work together or they don't work together based on how well your, your waves, your sound waves, line up with each other. The thing is, if two instruments are not tuned to be lining up with each other on specific notes, then even though the notes you're playing are supposed to line up, the end result is that they 
don't. And it creates a very specific type of tight dissonance. It's a very tight warbling of sound. Um, rather than more of a looser warble that happens with uh, choosing notes that clash together. It is something that anybody can learn to hear. You just have to practice and train yourself. And, you know, after playing an instrument for like 15 years and tuning your instrument against, well, you know, a tuning pipe or other instruments or whatever, for like most days of those 15 years, you develop a really good ear for dissonance. <laughs> it just, it takes a lot of practice. Um, and you can hear the different types of dissonance. And what I get out of this one, though, is a very tight warble, which sounds like the notes are out of wavelengths with each other. They're just out of tune. And so this has been bothering me for like the past 30 minutes or so, the last few tracks. I just keep thinking. I'm, I'm listening to the, the dissonance that's introduced. And I'm like, okay, that one's probably harmonic. They're choosing notes that are clashing a little bit. And then I listen to others. I'm like, no, no, their instruments are just out of tune, I think. And I haven't really come to a consensus on it. And I'm kind of curious if anybody has seen any interviews, because I've found nothing about this group, honestly, when I, I checked a little bit ago. But do they intentionally untune, detune their instruments to achieve some of these sounds? And if so, is it scientific? Because we have uh, a way of notating how close to a pitch you are. And we use a, a concept called sense. Um, and usually if you're within five cents of the note, you're probably going to be okay. Instruments detune themselves over time anyways. So um, especially if you tune when your instrument's cold, which is a terrible idea, you always want to warm up first and then tune because when you warm it up, your pitch is going to change. You're going to have to retune it. Um, but anyways, yeah, we, we use a system called sense and it shows you how close to the note you are based on how many cents you are. Um, and so would they specifically say, oh, I want to be 20 cents under, uh, under tuned, right? And then they would tune all of their guitar strings to be 20 cents under. Um... And then, you know, that would definitely give them a very scientific, reproducible, clashing sound for every show. Or is it just, okay, I tuned my string to E, I'm just going to spin the dial a little bit, you know, give it a little half twist or something, and go a bit rougher of an estimation that way. I'm, I'm kind of curious how that all goes. And that's even if they detune at all. It's just something I'm hearing that I, I keep tossing it back and forth, whether it's just harmonic dissonance or intonation dissonance and... I don't know. Like I said, I'll, I'll take some, I'll take any sort of information on that because it's going to drive me up a wall if I keep thinking about it. Um, that leaves us with two more tracks here. We got Cross Lives and Melting Glass. Was there anything else I wanted to bring? I don't think so. Oh, actually, there is one quick thing I noticed uh, when I pulled up the album page. Uh, to see the play times uh, a couple of songs back. This album just came out June 7th. I think that is the most recent of an album review I've ever done. And it's all totally happenstance. It's not like I went and said, oh, I want to do a, you know, a new one. I just grabbed it, but I was reading something. I think it might've been on the band camp. It said, you know, their, their recent, uh, albums have been well received and, um, I was like, oh, you know, I wonder where this fits in there. Well, now I know. <laughs> This is their most recent. It literally just came out a couple weeks ago. So that actually might account a little bit for their low play numbers, though they only have 41,000 monthly listeners too. Of course, just on Spotify, maybe they are more popular on Bandcamp. But uh, yeah, like I said, that might account for a little bit of it. Even if they have 42,000 monthly listeners, you would think that they're mega fans or at least regular fans and they would be checking out a new album. Maybe they just haven't gotten around to it yet. So... It'll be interesting to see how those numbers change over time. Although it also gives me a different relationship there as well. The numbers decrease, and I assume that was just people not making it to the end. But what if they listen to the album and they don't like what they're hearing? They make it three tracks in and say, oh, I've heard enough, and they never come back to it. Hmm. Makes me wonder how this song relates to the rest of their discography. Again, it's, it's too early to tell, honestly, at this point, given that it's, I mean... 
yeah, two weeks ago. This album is only two weeks old. It has not been out long enough to, to get any accurate data out of listens yet, but still kind of curious about that. All right, let's push forward. Cross lives. And like I said, if I don't have a lot to say, we're just going to push it forward into melting glass and see what's going on there. But the song is almost six minutes long, too. So, I don't know. We'll play it by ear. We'll wing it. When the song's over, you'll figure out if we're going for an analysis section or just continuing on. Let's dive in with Cross Lives. Once again, playing around with spaciousness, moving ideas. Dude, that groove came out of nowhere. Oh, there's something odd going on here too. Yeah, the phrasing changes from groups of two and three, and I can't quite find a pattern in there, but there's also, it starts off with groups of four. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pick that out on this first time, but there is some really funky rhythmic stuff going on with this core motif. find the beginning of the phrase that's the thing too like the drums giving me a consistent 4-4 four, four. if I could just find the phrasing I could find the time signature real easy the drum shifting to three here isn't helping either very light and ethereal and bouncy if it wasn't for the confusing rhythmic ideas this would be a, feel very much like Flying. But the rhythmic elements keep it grounded. The reverb on the guitar is a really nice touch. Just another another showcase of the strong production. Ooh, a little harp. Absolutely loving this. Just gorgeous stuff. We're returning back to the beautiful lines we had all the way back in something like Evermore. Drummer getting to pop off a little bit too, but primarily to me this is a guitar melody section. Giving us that final note of resolution on such the tiniest piano note <laughs> with everything else cut out. 
so unexpected. It was like, like watching a car drive off into like water, but instead of crashing into the water, it turns into a boat and just goes off. You're like, that's not what should have happened. <laughs> Such an unexpected twist there. And then this ambience. Hmm. crazy drum and bass thing going on over there. Wild beat. I'm sorry, excuse me? What? No, no, why, why would you do that? It's so like the first four minutes of this song made a lot of sense. I'm not going to say it was predictable in any way. It definitely had plenty of twists and turns. But ever since we hit that random <laughs> single piano note in isolation, chordal resolution, we bring this massive, huge section down to a single piano note, just a ping, and then, and then, silence. Ever since that moment, the song went bonkers crazy. I have no idea what any of the rest of it, I mean, we got a break beat going on in like the back left side of the production, and it's this fast drum and bass sort of uh, beat going on. It's all, it's a digital guitar, I mean, digital drum kit too, which I think is the first time we've heard digital drums on this album at all. Um, and just a real fast idea back there. And then we have ambient sounds, little twinkles and crackles and, uh, this drone going on sort of in the background, sort of slowly pacing from one side to the other very atmospheric except for this bass uh this, uh this drum kit and it's not even centered where the drum has been this entire album it's just a little bit off to the side and again it's the fastest drum work we've had it's also a very clearly digital drum sounds that doesn't necessarily mean it's not the drummer they could be um what do they call it uh any, when you play the drum kit but it oh triggers it could be triggering MIDI sounds. So it could actually be being played on a drum kit just using non-drum kit uh, recordings for it. Regardless, it is a totally different beat than anything we've heard. Totally different placement. Totally different timbre. Um, and then it feels like it's building up towards something. And we get this big, blasty, blown speaker sound. Um, lots of energy. Lots of drive. Lots of presence. And we get it for like three beats and then nothing. And I'm like, okay, you know, we just count four more beats. It'll come back in. We do this a couple times. And 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 no, it just did it the once and then the song faded into obscurity. But, but why? Huh? What? The whole final like minute 45 seconds just legitimately makes no sense to me. I don't even know. I, I I had thoughts about the rest of the song too, but I can't even remember them because the ending just completely overrode my entire experience with this track. Oh, I it's coming back. It's coming back. We'll still talk about the rest of the song. Just thrown for the biggest loop though. I mean, I know I said back at the beginning, I want more keyboard representation. I want to hear more of the, the ambient electronic stuff. And we got it here. It's just like, 
in the most bizarre execution. And I, I don't get the last two minutes, give or take. Just wild stuff. It, it, it gave me a chuckle, kind of maybe confused, really made me think hard. Like, I enjoy that element of it. One of my favorite things about this channel is being shown stuff that I don't get. Whether it's because it's outside of my, my grasp of music, it's in a style that I don't have words for, maybe it's just doing a lot of obtuse ideas. Um, I like to hear music get pushed to its limits and go outside of my framework of understanding. And this one does. So like, I, I enjoy it from that perspective. But, dude, I don't get it at all. At all. At all. At all. All right. The rest of this track, though, I liked. As I mentioned, it kind of jumps back to the idea of Evermore, something heavily focused on positive consonant harmony, uh, sorry, positive consonant melody with these beautiful guitar lines. Absolutely loved them. We had multiple of them in here. Uh, very ethereal, light sections with just the most gorgeous guitar ideas. Um, and I, like I mentioned, even the production shifts, moving away from full-bodied ideas to sounds that are ethereal and light, very whispery. Um, it gave the illusion of flight, of soaring, moving through clouds. I really love these ideas. And like I said, they harken back to some of the stuff that we haven't heard for a half an hour now. I thought that was really cool because we spent a lot of time here in the middle of the album focusing on full-bodied production and we kind of lost track of the more melodic side that the album explored at the beginning so it was nice to get back to that and explore these really fantastic guitar because you know that was something that i praised after evermore was the strong melody writing it just dawned on me i haven't talked about strong melody writing in a while we've had good melody writing it's taken us through these songs, but we've also experienced a few tracks that are heavily focused on atmosphere more than anything else, where melody is a secondary component to that, if there's even a strong amount of melody in the track at all. So it was nice to return to this style again, because it is, I think, my favorite from them. Yeah. Yeah. Their guitar writing. See, here's the thing, too. And it makes me wonder. Because, well, actually, now that I, I remember back, Tatrin doesn't compose their own music. Which actually brings to question a couple of things. One, I gotta go back and look at who composed what. Because there is this element of, of cohesion and pacing throughout the album that works really well. But if I remember correctly, there are very few tracks that were ordered in a row that were composed by the same person. For instance, I don't believe tracks one and two, the No and Evermore, were composed by the same person. And yet I feel like they're two sides of the same coin. I think it's really awesome that two people composed very similar music enough in a way that I could see them as a, a parallel duality. And the same thing goes with Fish's Tears and Seth. Um, but I think it's very clear to me that something like Candies and Bleach were written by very different people who wrote The No or Evermores or Lovers. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. I want to go back and check that out um, after track nine, after we finish it, right? I'll try to remember to look at that and see if I can't glean anything about the composers themselves and what kind of music they like to write and if we can't see any patterns throughout here based on who composed what. But uh, the other thing that stands out to me is that consistently the keyboard solos are noisy, chaotic ideas. Anytime the keyboard gets a solo section, it's, it's kind of an abrasive melody line. And anytime the guitarist gets one, it's a beautiful line. I think there are a couple of, you know, the jazzier sections uh, where the, the guitarist will pull in some spicier ideas or some stuff that's not quite harmonically consonant. But on the whole, the guitar solos are beautiful. The keyboard solos are nasty <laughs> uh, in a good way. But yeah, 
it, it it's kind of bonkers that despite having four different composers on the album that patterns like that continue to crop up i think that's wild um oh yeah aside from the beautiful ethereal floating kind of stuff that we have with the guitar work we also had our really interesting opening of the track that we eventually saw again later on right before the strange break in the, before the the back quarter of the track um this one is very rooted. It stands in stark opposition to... Actually, there's another thing, too, is the contrast. Every single one of these tracks is contrasty on multiple layers. And I find that to be an interesting pattern, given that there's so many different people with their hands in the cookie jar as far as composition goes. And it's not congruent, either. It's not to say that everybody's always composing on every song... You know, some of these songs are written by one person, and yet they still have contrast in ways that another song written by a single different person also incorporates contrast. It's like they got a group of people together who all have similar compositional styles, but maybe not compositional sounds. They all paint with different palettes, but they all utilize the same language. And I think that's awesome. That metaphor fell apart real quick. I hope you held on for that ride. <laughs> We went through sound, art, and language in like half a second. <laughs> uh, geez. But yeah, that rhythmic thing at the beginning of this track was bonkers. I think I landed on the idea that it was 18 bars of three. I'm not 100% on that. That is a bonkers idea, and it is totally linear too, and that's what makes the phrasing on it so difficult. But aside from the idea that it is probably in 3-4... There's also the phrasing concept that comes in when you listen to the guitar itself. Sometimes you'll get three beat phrases. Sometimes you'll get two beat phrases. Sometimes you'll get four beat phrases. I don't think I heard anything other than that. Um, but the way that they get mixed up, it's really difficult to follow a pattern without something. Well, even with the drums on the back, just emphasizing one and three or whatever they were doing, giving us a steady backbeat. It's still difficult to follow along with it. Um, because of how chaotic the, the phrasing is in the guitars. But yeah, if anybody has some insight to that one, also, comments, you know the deal, let me know if you have a, a thought about the time signature there, or the phrasing in general. Um, I could be very off on the, the 18 bars of 3. It was literally the last time through that section, um, and it happened to be guitar only. So I think that kind of helped me a little bit. I had no... Nothing to distract me from the counting of this idea, but it was bonkers, which is, I mean, it just goes to show too, one thing I love about this band is they can write the most simplest ideas, like the bass, pedal tones, the drums, a uh, simple metronome style thing, the guitar, a simple, beautiful melody line, and then maybe something, some synth in the background to give us some of that uh, atmospheric stuff. And just super gorgeous, simple writing. And then the next song, they'll give me something so tough, I walk away from it and I'm like, I don't know what the time signature was. Y'all are on your own with this one. <laughs> and for, for a song to send me to such extremes in my uh, my listening of it, I think that's pretty awesome. You, know, you, just, you just don't see that too often. A band's usually exactly who they are. They might have a different couple of styles, but they usually operate on a consistent... Um, density of composition and this band just doesn't and i think part of that does come from the plethora of composers but you also have to remember that the the band itself has the chops to perform um on both of these levels too so i i don't know i really enjoy that there's a lot of cool things that come out of separating your musicians from your composers and uh you know i think this is one of them you get contrast you get dynamic qualities in the performative elements you get to hear some of the more tasteful uh, ideas that support a song more so than showcase the artist that uh, you know the guitarist itself and then you get sections that just like the guitarist goes off the drummer goes off the bass has crazy ideas everybody's doing this wild polyrhythmic stuff and you're like what is going on you guys are obviously talented but can we get back to that chill stuff you wrote last song <laughs> uh and it's just really cool to see that dynamic quality to an album uh, where every song really could be very different from the last. Um, 
So yeah, I guess we're going to be pushing forward with melting glass next. Only four minutes left in the album. Let's wrap it up. The slight detunement, the slight warble of sounds, which I think is a production thing, kind of feels like melting glass. We also have the chord shaping. Dancing around the chord, never playing the whole one, but playing all the notes of the chord. Really tense ideas. I do like the organy sound over here that is doing a texture layering with our lead guitar. I like the warm, warm sound coming in underneath everything. Beautiful chord progression too with the additional string stuff on the side. Those little stings are nice too. Notes like those last two, really strong consonant harmony beautiful contrast to some of the tenser sounds that we have. Drums just got off a bit there. They shifted from the downbeats to the offbeats. Yeah, I wouldn't say that's a ridiculously strong way to end an album, but honestly, there's so little through point on this album that any ending is going to work, I think. Especially with the, the pacing of the album, the way it is, I don't know how much attention actually went into the order of the songs. Because I kind of feel like Bleach should have been the track 8 our penultimate track because it reaches some crazy heights uh, at the end of it. But even that, you know, it brings the energy down quite a bit at the end of the song too, uh, in the final few seconds. So 
I don't know that any of these songs really created a, a pacing to it, other than just the general contrast, moving between more palatable tracks with uh, more focus on consonants versus more noisier tracks with more of a focus on dissonance, which I think they did a good job on that balancing when and how much of uh, one you got versus the other. But even here, we end on a song that... There's a lot of tension in here. We could have ended on something like Evermore that would have brought more consonant harmony to it to create a sense of resolution for the album, but they didn't want to go that route. And we end up with something that kind of leans a little bit more towards that darker tension to wrap the album up. And to me, that kind of feels a little anticlimactic, but I might be alone in that too. Aside from its placement in the album, though, I did enjoy the song. It returns back to something akin to the no, where we start off with a baseline idea. We keep that baseline idea pretty much through the majority of the track, and we explore more and more layers on it, sometimes removing layers and slipping things into them, sometimes passing on a layer from one sound to another. There's a lot of play in here on finding out what the full version of this sound is going to be. Uh, we start off with something very simple, add some layers, add some more layers, remove some layers, add some layers, and by the end we have this big massive moment at, you know, was that like 3.45, just you know, like 30 seconds before the end of the track. And um, we get to hear this very full rendition of this concept, and I do like that build up, and like I said, it kind of makes it a little cyclical. We never really explored another song like the no, not exactly like that. We still had ideas of slow burns and growth over time, but not, I think, that exact concept of a single A section and a full exploration of it until we have a thorough understanding of what this sound is and can be. And so to start and end with very similar concepts, that's kind of cool. I, I dig that. Um, this one does play around a lot more with intonation, though, tension, dissonance. Um, it's called melting glass, right? And I mentioned at the beginning the waviness of the sounds from the production, the intonation elements that come in with the instruments just not being consonant in their harmony, you know? Again, I don't know if it's because the instruments are detuned or if it's because they're selecting notes that are, are clashing with each other. But all of it kind of makes it sound like a toy that's broken, uh, a little music box that's at the end of its winding, or a little uh, battery-operated toy where the battery's down to like 3% and is sort of growing out now. And you kind of have this, this fading out of existence feeling in a lot of this track. Uh, sort of melting. I, I kind of get that feeling in here. Um, they do a good job of, of creating that atmosphere and sticking with it, which I think is the important thing for this song. It's what keeps it cohesive despite all the new layers, the removal of old layers. You, we do have that foundation at the bottom that holds the entire song together, but the production is also a glue, ensuring that this um, weirdly... I don't even know how to describe it batteries draining from the device playing the song is really my best way of describing the atmosphere on this and we keep it consistent throughout the whole album no matter what instruments come in they all have this sort of slow sluggish imperfection to them it fits really well and, and keeps the song consistent throughout um but like i mentioned harmonically we also play around with this intonation um and a lot of this song ends up feeling a bit less resolved because of it. And I just, uh, I think it's a fine song. I just, I'm not too happy with it wrapping the, the album up. I think it belongs in the middles, in the middles, in the middle of the album, maybe after Seth. I don't want to put it too close to Candies because I feel like they're too similar. But I don't want to put it between Fish's Tears and Seth either because I still think they should have been inverted but still back to back. So yeah, pop this up to track 7, swap 5 and 6 around, push Bleach and Cross Lives down, finish the album on Cross Lives, that's probably be really good. 
that's, that's, I guess that's where I sit on it. It, it's, uh, I mean, it does what a final track should do. You should either have your most bombastic song to wrap the album up, or it should be a re, uh, what do you, what would you call it? A recap of everything. And I think it does. It has some very beautiful melodies in it. It has a little bit of noise in it. There's a lot of contrast between dark and light harmony. Um, and it's very, very focused on production over pretty much anything else, which is something we explored a lot on this album, even if it's not necessarily, I think, an exclusive element of how they craft a sound. It still does crop up enough for me to say that it's a core component of this album, and for them to smash all this together in a song that, I mean, honestly, I don't know any other group doing something like this, so it's to, to me, in my limited experience of music, having only listened to, like, I don't know, 2,000 bands, uh, it's very Tatron. It is. So maybe from that perspective, it is a good album outro. I guess that wraps up my analysis. I did say, by the end, I wanted to look over composers, so... Let's check this out real quick. Um, tracks 1, 4, and 6 were composed by Ophir. So The No, Seth, and Candies. Oh! Oh! So The No was kind of, to me, it's sort of the de facto sound of the album. It sets up more of the more palatable ideas that we will explore further into this album but then he also did candies which is the most chaotic on the album and seth which is one of the more simple ones that i kind of wished uh, i heard inversely with fish's tears uh, now tamuz tamuz did two five and nine evermore which was my favorite fish's tears which was my second favorite and melting glass which it's a good song it is, but it's it's more dissonant and wavy. It's it's very uh, texture-like. In fact, that's actually a good description for that one. A lot of the other songs, I can sit back and say I like the melodies, I like the harmonies, uh, I like the atmospheres. But Melting Glass, the way that we wrap this album up, is very much about texture, which is something we don't really explore too much on the album, other than Candies, which I think it's interesting that this isn't the person who composed Candies. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this dude composed Evermore and Fish's Tears, which were my two top songs on this, so I kind of have a favored composer on this album. <laughs> uh, now, both of those worked together to do Cross Lives, which is track eight, which I thought was done really well. That's definitely a close third for me. And then tracks three and seven, Lovers and Bleach, the two long ones, were composed by both of those, plus Dan Mayo, which is one of the members... Oh, wait... You ever realize something and then just kind of apparently I'm having some reading comprehension issues today because Dan, Temuz, and Afir are the three members of the band. There aren't different composers for it. So everything I talked about earlier about really enjoying the fact that this group has a set of composers to make the music and then they play is all wrong. All of it is wrong. I don't know how I missed this, but yeah. So I don't know what instruments they play, but all three of them handle composition duties. Well, two of them do. Dan Mayo only helped on tracks three and seven, um, but the other two members of the band composed all the songs pretty much either together or on their own dang that is like a terrible thing to realize two and three quarter hours into an analysis where i have praised the fact where i've praised a false understanding of how this uh this band works Okay, so I'm probably going to see a lot of comments about that, and then a lot of edits. Oh, made it to the end of the video, and you figured it out. Um, 
you know what? Comments are engagement. So I'm just going to roll with this one and be embarrassed in in on the inside. Because <laughs> it is a very embarrassing thing that I could not read something as simple as this. Anyways, um, I definitely have a, a favorite composer here. Um, to Moses, just it's so good, and I apologize that I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but yeah, Evermore and Fish's Tears, which he did by himself, are two of my favorite tracks on this album. Um, and everything that I said about different composers for a band that aren't in a band that's all false, so I'm just uh retroactively taking all that back. Uh, maybe I'll do something in the timestamp for it. Uh, to let you all know that in post, not even in post, geez, I didn't even make it through the end of this. Eventually, I, I've learned the error of my ways. Um, so yeah, let's wrap this up then, now that I have sufficiently made an ass of myself. All right, those are my thoughts on Tatrin's Evermore. Let me know what you thought of this album, if there's anything that stands out to you, anything you'd like to add on to what I said, or correct me on... Maybe you just have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspectives on this album. Let me know. I also had a lot of questions about the album and was looking for interviews or any sort of uh, authorial intent behind this concept, behind this album. I mean, if you have any of that, throw that down in the comments as well. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you to this menu right here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. UTC. We're going to do a live stream. I'm there for two hours. Come by, drop in, hang out. We chit chat, we listen to music. It's just really chill and laid back. And uh, honestly, it's a blast. I don't want to pat myself on the back. We got a pretty cool community though, and uh, lots of cool conversations that happen there. And if you're not there for conversation, we do listen to 10 songs, and I give my thoughts on those as well. So, you know, if you're there for reactions, we got that. If you're there for company and conversation, we got that too. Uh, lots of laughs. It's just, it's a blast. All right, and then Monday, of course, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to kick it off with next week's theme. All right, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.